this project is a preprint uh, that is uh, currently available. I'm going to show you the link at the end, but it's called uh, Learning Relational Rules from Rewards. And this is just that. So uh, you may be muted, Guillermo. Am I? No, you're not. Okay. Okay. Let's just start then. So um, people can generalize what they learn about specific uh, instances of a problem uh, to new instances of the same problem. So for example, if a person learns to play checkers on a standard 8x8 board, uh, she can easily play the game on a 12x12 board. We can also go beyond uh, task-specific generalizations and use what we have learned about one problem to, uh, you know, when facing uh, different problems. So for example, a person that uh, can use what they learn about checkers uh, when uh, playing chess. Now, this kind of a generalization uh, based on deep uh, structural similarities is known as cross domain generalization. So the question is, what's behind this kind of generalization? Now, as many other people, uh, my colleagues and I have uh, proposed that relational reasoning is the main driver of this kind of generalization, specifically analogy. And this is because thinking in terms of the roles that the entities play in a situation allows us to establish relational correspondences or mappings across different situations. Uh, so for example, across these two games, the red puddle in breakout is like the green puddle in pong uh, because the player can move it to hit the uh, to hit the, uh, the the ball. Now, analogy making allows us to go beyond establishing correspondences between objects. So, for example, when pl uh, when playing breakout, a person can learn that if the ball is to the right of the puddle, one should move to the right, which is uh, shown here in logic notation. Now, if the same person plays Pong for the first time, she will notice the similarity between uh, the red puddle in Breakout and the green puddle in Pong, uh, and as well as the ball in both games. Now, this person will also notice the similarity between the ball and puddle relationship across games. In this case, the more Y relation in Pong is like the more X relation in Breakout. And finally, through the process of uh, analogical inference, this person could predict the correct action in Pong even before scoring or losing any points. Now, it turns out that uh, this kind of thing is exactly what we did in a, did in a previous work, where we use the DORA model of a relation learning and analog uh, analogical reasoning to do transfer learning between video games. Now, I'm not going to discuss this work much in detail here because it was already presented uh, by Alex Dumas in this seminar. But in oral terms, we built a preprocessor to get feature based representations of objects. We then used Dora to learn relational representations of those objects. Uh, then we use uh, these representations to describe the state of the game and apply uh, reinforcement, reinforcement learning to learn a policy uh, to play the game. And then we presented the model with a new game, in this case Pong, and applied analogical inference to infer a policy for the new game without uh, playing it, right? Uh, without training it. Um, now, uh, in that project, we made a big assumption, right? Uh, when doing reinforcement learning, we pre-selected the relevant relations to learn uh, the initial policy. This is before doing transfer learning. So the main question of, question of this project is, uh, is how we can learn to select the relevant relations to build a relational policy from a large vocabulary of relations. Now, to do this, I need to talk a little bit about reinforcement learning. In RL, there is a constant interaction between the agent and its environment. In a given state of, of the environment, the agent uh, takes an action and the environment responds by transitioning to a new state and returning a reward. Reinforcement learning algorithms are designed to learn a policy, which is a mapping between the states and actions uh, that maximizes the long-term reward. Now, RL algorithm, algorithms can be classified uh, into model-based and model-free. 
uh, in model base RL, uh, the agent learns a transition function from states and actions to new states and a reward function from states uh, to rewards. And the agent can use this uh, model, uh, uh, sorry, and these two functions correspond to the model of the environment. And the agent can use this model uh, to plan the best course of action at any given state through simulation. Now, in model free RL, uh, the agent uses prediction errors to learn the value of taking each action in each state uh, directly. These values can then be used to build the policy by greedy selection of the action with the highest value in each state. Now, the project I'm going to talk about today is a model-free method for reinforcement learning. Now, the most influential model-free algorithm is Q-learning. This method approximates the state action value function. Now, what is uh, uh, the state action value function? Is this expected cumulative reward uh, given that the I agent is in the current state and takes the current action? Now, these cumulative rewards include a discount factor. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, uh, these uh, cumulative rewards include a, include a discount factor that awaits more rewards uh, closer in time. Now, in tabular Q learning, these estimates uh, these estimates are stored in a table where the columns correspond to the actions and the rows to the states. Now. Q-learning estimates these values through this uh, learning rule. Now here, uh, the new Q-value estimate is equal to the old value estimate plus a weighted sum of the immediate reward, reward and the difference between the maximum, uh, maximum estimated Q-value at the next, next state and the old estimate. And the idea is that by applying this equation iteratively, uh, the table will converge to the optimal state action value function. Now, Q-learning is guaranteed to converge to the optimal policy as long as each state action pair is, visit, is visited infinitely often. However, for larger states uh, spaces, uh, this becomes uh, impractical and impossible in reality. And this is especially relevant for the relation setting. Now, to illustrate this, let's define N as the number of objects, R the number of relations, and A as the arity of the relations considered. And here I'm going to consider that all relations have the same arity just for simplicity. Now, given these parameters, the size of the state space is defined by this equation, which is two to the power of the number of uh, uh, combinations uh, which is two to the power of the combinations of the number of objects on the arity of the relations times the number of relations. Now, uh, let's say that we have an environment where there are four objects and the, all the relations have arity two, right? And what I'm, going to show, what I'm about to show you is what happens to the size of the state space as we increase the number of relations. And as you, as you can see, this means that a tabular approach is never going to work in this uh, in the relational setting, at least not in general, right? And even if you could somehow uh, learn the full table, uh, that's not really what you want, right? What you want is a method that abstracts away the irrelevant parts of the state space uh, so that you can get a policy that is as simple and as general as possible. Now, the problem of learning an, an optimal policy in an environment described as a set of objects and relations between them has been studied in AI under the name of uh, relational reinforcement learning. Now, in standard approaches to relational reinforcement learning, the policy is represented as a set of variableized rules uh, in a subset of uh, first-order first logic. For example, in this blocks world, uh, the task of the agent is to unstack all the blocks. And the policy that is being shown uh, says that if block X is on top of any block uh, uh, Y, move 
move X to the floor. Now, notice that in this policy, uh, it doesn't make any reference to any particular block. Now, in contrast, in this project, I'm going to concentrate on learning uh, what are called uh, ground rules. These are rules that refer to specific objects uh, and specific actions. This is for the sake of simplicity, but, it's, but I also think that the variabilization of rules is a separate cognitive process uh, that is more related to schema induction. Now, uh, from a cognitive point of view, an interesting attribute of classical um, relational reforms and learning algorithms is that they build uh, policies incrementally. That is, they gradually add rules to the policy that improve uh, its overall quality. Another important attribute of these algorithms is that they have to deal with the discrete nature of our relational representations. Uh, this is because describing the state in terms of relations imposes sharp partitions of the state space. So for example, in this breakout rule, uh, this breakout rule partitions the state space into states where the player is to the right of the ball and states where it's not. There is no in-between states. And to do all of this, uh, our model adapts a specialized functional approximator developed in uh, relational uh, reinforcement learning. Now, the main idea behind this approach is that you can use regression trees to represent the state action values. And let me illustrate this uh, with the paddle and the ball example. Let's say that uh, the player decides to move uh, right. Now, the value of this action is going to depend on the state we are in, right? In this example, the spatial relation between the ball, the, the paddle and the ball is going to entail a ranking of possible values, right? Now, in the original model of Driessens and their colleagues, this ranking will be represented by a tree where each node is a relation and each leaf is a Q value. Critically, the splits here are logical. So if the relation holds, you go into one branch, and if the relation doesn't hold in the, in the state, you go into another branch, right? Uh, but note that to capture uh, the ranking of key values uh, implied, uh, the tree needs to make two splits. Now, in, con in contrast, in our model, instead of doing logical splits, uh, we are going to do comparative uh, splits. And the main advantage of this is that we can express the same ranking of Q values all at once. In either case, to make a prediction, the agent traverses the state action trees according to the relations present in the state until it reaches a leaf. The predicted Q value can then be used to select an action and can be updated according to the standard uh, Q learning learning rule. Now I'm going to explain how to grow these trees, right? Uh, at the beginning of learning, uh, all the trees have a single leaf. Uh, and at this stage of learning, uh, the key value represents the overall value of the action in the environment. Now, all the trees cons consider the same initial set of candidate relations to grow uh, leaves, new leaves. Now, as the agent interacts with the, with the environment, each state action tree keeps track of three numbers, which are the number of visits, uh, uh, the mean of the Q values, and the scale variance of the Q values. Now, as well as the same statistics uh, for all potential partitions induced by each candidate, that is for more, same, or less. Right now, all these statistics are calculated incrementally at each time step through these equations, right? And you know, like the reason we use the scale variance instead of just the variance is because it's easier um, to build the incremental equation for the scale variance than for the variance directly. Now, after a minimal uh, sample size, which is it's a free parameter of the model, has been reached, these statistics uh, can be used to compute for each candidate 
the F ratio between the variance of the Q values if the, if the leaf was split according to the candidate and the variance of the Q values of the unsplit uh, leaf. And we have the equations for the logical and our comparative version of the model. Now, with this ratio, the model calculates P values for a standard one tail F test for all candidates. If the smallest P value is smaller than a set significance level, uh, the leaf is split according to the candidate. And the process continues until the tree, uh, tree cannot find new splits or reaches um, maximum tree depth. And in all our simulations, we set the maximum tree depth to 10, the minimal sample size to 100,000, and the significance level to 0 0.001. Now, uh, without explaining, I'm going to show you uh, our main simulations. Uh, basically, we have we apply this uh, um, model to three different games. Right now, in our first simulation, uh, we use the game Breakout, which is the simplest environment that we are going to consider here. Now in breakout, the player controls a bubble and receives points when the ball bounces the, the wall on the top of the screen. And the player loses points if the ball uh, and the paddle, uh, well, if the ball passes the paddle when it's going down. Now, the, uh, the actions available to the agent are noob, which is no operation or do nothing, uh, fire, right and left. Now, the actions noob and fire have no effect during the game, however, at the beginning of the game, the agent has to execute the fire action uh, to start, otherwise nothing happens. And to succeed on this game, the agent needs to learn to follow the ball, which requires to, bear, to pay more attention to the relations across the X dimension than to the relations across the uh, Y dimension. Now, to represent the state of the, of the environment, we use the X and Y relations between the player and the ball, and the X and Y relations between the ball at the current time step and the ball, uh, the ball and the, at the previous time step. So that's a way to basically encode the trajectory of the ball uh, with the relations. Uh, we created two versions of the state, a logical version for the logical uh, version of the model and a comparative version for the comparative version of the model. And during the construction of the state, we filter out all the states where the ball was not present. And this is mainly because of the uh, frequency statistics approach that we used to uh, determine the um, tree splits. Uh, to compete in equal grounds, all candidates should, should have the same number of visits. And if you consider states where uh, one object is not present, uh, that's not the case anymore. Now, under these assumptions, the size of the state space is 81, and this is already uh, something that is beyond uh, what a tabular approach uh, can handle. Actually, with, I, I tried to train a tabular reinforcement learning with this size uh, of the state space, and it doesn't work. Now, and by the way, that's the reason I'm not showing a tabular uh, uh, agent on any of the simulations, because in any of these simulations, it's never going to work. Now, uh, we use the, these are the training details. Uh, we use the breakout deterministic uh, version four of the OpenAI gene toolkit. We use a visual preprocessor, which use the color and shape of the objects to calculate their, uh, their X and Y positions. And from that, we calculated the spatial relationships. Now, all the agents included an action buffer that stored the last 10 actions and checked whether the agent had taken the same action 10 times in a row, in which case the current action was uniformly sampled from the action space. Um, now, for each of the two versions of the model, we trained 10 runs on 2 million iterations. And these are our um, reinforcement learning parameters. And Finally, we transform the reward signal using the sign function. So basically, if the reward was positive, it was always one. Uh, if it was zero, it was zero. And if it was negative, it was always uh, minus one. And this is the same for all the simulations. 
Now, this plot shows the cumulative return for the logical and the comparative versions of the model uh, for each one of the ten runs. And as you can see, overall, uh, the runs of the comparative version receive more rewards uh, during training. Because in breakout, uh, episodes with higher returns are necessarily longer, the runs in this version, uh, in the comparative version, uh, reach the 2,000, uh, 2 million iterations in fewer episodes. And furthermore, the runs in the comparative version were also more consistent. Uh, so they basically had less variability than in the logical version. Now, uh, during training, we save the agents a set of state action trees every 200,000 iterations. And after the training session finished, we, we tested each set of uh, trees on 10 games and picked the one with the, uh, with, uh, with the best uh, performance. And that became the agent uh, final uh, test tree. Um, what else? Ah, yeah, for testing, we set the probability of taking a random action to a very low number, basically. And the results were much, as you can see, the results were much more consistent in the comparative version with eight out of 10 uh, runs achieving an average returns above 50 in comparison to only three in the logical condition. Now, the logical ver version of our model was able to discriminate between the different comparative values of the X relation uh, only, uh, oh, sorry, this is there. I, again, the logical, the logical version, not the comparative version, the logical version of the model was able to discriminate the different comparative values of the X relation only regarding uh, the left action. And that's in the, uh, the plot uh, A, right? However, the left tree also induced a test involving the trajectory of the pole in the Y dimension. And I hope uh, the figure is like big enough to, for you, for you guys to appreciate, uh, which increases the overall complexity of the policy. Now, all the other state action trees may split based on the uh, object X relation, but did not discriminate between all its comparative values. In contrast, the comparative version was able to discriminate between all the comparative values on the X relation for all actions. Now, uh, the state action trees can, uh, of the comparative version can be translated uh, into the following uh, relational rule. And clearly, uh, the agent learned to follow the ball. Now, what is uh, more striking, is, uh, what is more uh, uh, interesting is that the agent preferred the fire, uh, fire action to the noob, noob action for not moving, since the game will not start unless the fire action was executed. Oh. In our second simulation, uh, we use the game Pong. In this game, there are two battles, a player and an enemy that hit the ball ball in order to make the ball pass the opponent. The player receives a positive rewards if the ball passes uh, over the enemy and negative rewards if the ball passes over the player. The episode ends when the ball passes over either player uh, 21 times. Now both the player and the enemy can only move in the y-axis and the ball can move in on the x and the y-axis. Now the x Actions available for the player in this environment are noob, fire, right, left, uh, left, right fire, and left fire. However, uh, as the last two actions have the same effect as right and left, we omitted them just for the sake of simplicity. Uh, we can talk uh, you know, about that uh, later uh, if you guys want. Um, let me check this. Okay. So, uh, the state representation. Because in Pong, there are uh, three objects instead of two. The number of potential, potential uh, object and trajectory, trajectory relations increases accordingly, right? So besides the object uh, and trajectory relations used in the previous simulation, we added two contact relations between the player and the ball, and the ball and the enemy. And these relations are necessarily logical, so in both versions of the model. 
And with all these relations, the size of the state space is above uh, 78,000. Uh, this is also discarding the states where the ball is not present. Now, uh, regarding training, um, in Pong, the enemy follows the ball by default. So we actually um, correlated the positions of the ball and the enemy in 10 random games, uh, games and found that the correlation was uh, 0 0.8. Right? So that means that the opponent in Pong is actually a, a good opponent. And you know, if you actually play the game, you will find that playing Pong is way harder than playing uh, Breakout, for example. So this has the effect of making the reward signal very sparse for an agent that follows a random policy. And you know, every uh, reinforcement learning agent at the beginning of training uh, basically follows a very random policy. So to address this issue, we added 0 0.1 to do to the reward at each time step to encourage the agent uh, to play uh, for as long as possible. Now, uh, regarding the training results, uh, the cumulative returns on, on Pong are smoother than in the previous game because of the extra reward that we added, added at each time step. Um, now, three runs of the comparative version uh, received only rewards corresponding to the extra term. term. And this also happened for two runs, runs of the logical version. However, uh, the comparative version received slightly more rewards uh, during training. Although it's less clear just because uh, everything is smooth uh, of the, because of the extra term. Now, uh, these are the results. Uh, first, on the um, y-axis, uh, we're showing the returns, but we rescale the returns to the 0 0 0.021 interval by adding 21 points. So this can be uh, interpreted as the number of times um, the player score a point uh, against the enemy, basically. Now, uh, eight out of 10 runs achieve performance above chance in the logical version and seven out of 10 in the comparative version, right? So in that sense, the results are a little bit better for the logical version. However, three runs of the comparative version uh, score around 14 points against the enemy in average, clearly surpassing the best logical run, which score about, uh, around nine points. Now here uh, we have the state action twist for the best and the worst run on Pong. The best is the one, uh, is the number A, the A and the worst is uh, B. Now the best run selected the Y relation between the player and the ball and achieved to discriminate between all its comparative values for all actions. And basically this policy is just following the ball in the Y dimension. In contrast, on the worst run, um, the fire and the right actions base their first split on the trajectory, on the Y trajectory re uh, relation of the ball, which, le which led to a set of trees that, uh, trees that was not able to compensate for uh, these early splits. And this highlights uh, one of the limitations of the uh, present version, the current version of this model, which is cannot undo a bad split uh, that leads to bad performance during training. Now, in our third simulation, uh, we use a game called Demon Attack. In this game, uh, a player, which is a space, uh, the spaceship at the bottom, uh, can only move on the X dimension. In the initial levels, there are big enemies that appear in waves of three. The player uh, uh, at the bottom most uh, enemy can shoot um, missiles. And in advanced levels, the big enemies uh, will split into two small enemies when they are shot. And the small enemies will descend on the, onto the spaceship and if they crash, uh, the player dies. Now, the, the actions available to the player in this environment are no, no fire, right, left, uh, right fire and uh, left fire, and we use all of them. Now, 
Uh, in this game, there can be up to break, uh, three big enemies and up to six more small enemies uh, uh, at the screen at any given time. So the number of potential uh, object relations is quite large. So we made some assumptions to make this uh, manual. Right? First of all, we use only object relations between the player and the other objects in the screen. The player missile was treated as part of the player uh, action, not as a separated object. And we treated uh, the enemy uh, projectiles as a single object. Uh, I hope that's clear from the picture there. Um, we did not use any trajectory relations, and we only considered states where there was uh, an enemy missile, and this is similar to the ball uh, manipulation in the previous uh, simulations. Now, under these assumptions, uh, these are all the relations that we use. The size of the state space is that number, <laughs> uh, which is obviously unmanageable for a tabular approach. Right? Uh, for training, we train 10 rounds on 3 million iterations uh, with the same parameters as, as the previous simulations. Now, we train on 3 million simulations because basically I thought it, the game was going to be harder, but actually all the results I'm going to show you, uh, you know, work uh, as well with 2 million iterations. So, you know, it was something that I thought that would be necessary and ended up being not necessary. Uh, in addition to the action buffer, uh, we included a reward buffer that checked whether the last 300 iterations yielded zero rewards, in which case the training episode was terminated and a new one was started. And that was just a hack that wasn't necessary for uh, the model to work. Um, I have no good reason to do it other than that. Now, these are the training results. And as you can see, uh, the runs of the comparative version received more rewards during training. And here, um, this, uh, the relationship between the, um, the length of the game and the, um, and the number of rewards doesn't hold anymore. So uh, you only have to look at the, you know, the cumulative uh, rewards independent of the uh, number of episodes. Oh, sorry, is that all? Yes. Now, uh, these are the uh, test results. Uh, as you can see here, we have two uh, baselines. Um, basically, we have a random agent and a fire agent. Uh, the random agent is just an agent that is taking random actions all the time. Uh, the fire agent uh, is also taking random actions, but uh, from the subset of fire actions. So the idea is that that agent is always fire firing. Right, so we wanted to make sure that you know the model was doing something better than you know uh, those two models. Um, both models were doing better than you know our baselines. Um, now, seven runs uh, of the comparative version uh, score above two thousand and five hundred points in average, which clearly surpass surpassed the best uh, performing uh, run of the logical uh, version. These are the best and the worst trees. Uh, now, the best run selected the X relation between the, pl the player and the enemy missile. However, it only made, made splits for the fire and the rat fire uh, actions. And if you look at the um, uh, translated rule at the right, you will see that the model learned a very simple policy that essentially amounts to stay away from the enemy missile and while shooting as much as possible. Uh, and that's, you know, this was a surprise for me. I thought the model would do something, uh, you know, uh, more complicated, but it turns out that a simple, simple policy, uh, you know, performs very well in this game. Uh, now, um, in the worst run, the fire action basically it's first split on the Y relation between the player and the enemy mis missile, uh, which led again to a set of trees that was not able to compensate for this early bad split. And again, this highlight highlights the incapability of this version of the model to undo a bad split during learn learning. Now, 
Uh, just to recapitulate, um, theories of energy making have been um, disconnected in general from notions of utility, uh, such as rewards or prediction errors. To start to bridge uh, this theoretical gap in this work, uh, you know, we investigated, investigated ways of integrated uh, relation representations with uh, the reinforcing, reinforcing learning framework. And this is a hard problem because of the discrete nature of relation representations and the combinatorial explosion that results from applying them to describe uh, the state of the environment. Now, um, we studied the problem of, of how to select uh, relevant relations to build a policy when there is a large vocabulary of uh, relations available to the agent. For this, we adapted a functional approximator developer, developed in relation reinforcement learning. And our model learns, uh, learns grounded relation policies by making ternary splits based on the comparative values more and less. And our model was able to learn simple all relational policies on three games with increasing, increasingly larger state spaces. Now, um, as previous models of relational reinforcement learning, uh, our model builds relational uh, policies incrementally. And I think, uh, yeah, at least for me, this is super important. Uh, in contrast, there are other approaches that follow a much uh, top-down strategy. Uh, these models represent the full set of possible programs or relational policies and use either a uh, gradient descent in the case of uh, neurosymbolic mo models or Bayesian inference in the case of uh, Bayesian models to prune the full set of programs and select uh, the one that yields the highest return. Now, ultimately, I think both approaches are complementary and most likely both approaches are going to be necessary. Uh, and I hope that this work helps to stimulate the, you know, further re uh, theoretical and empirical research about how people and other animals build relational policies. Uh, yeah, that's the link to our preprint. And there is also a GitHub repository with all the code base for this uh, project. And finally, I have to thank my uh, PhD supervisor, Alex Dumas, and, me, and my PI in the University of Bristol, Jeff Flowers. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you.